Judges 13. Henry, it's really good to see you. I popped over the other day to, to see you, but you were, were busy or gone, and, uh, but it's good to see you. You're welcome to say something if you want. Okay. Yeah. Runs in the family. Eugene's the same way. But not Caroline. <laughs> uh, Judges 13, reading from verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines forty years. And there was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall uh, come on his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God. Very terrible. But I asked him not whence he was, neither told me his name. But he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and, now, and drink no wine, nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O my Lord, let that man of God which thou didst send come again unto us and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. And God hearkened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came unto the woman as she sat in the field, but Manoah, her husband, was not with her. And the woman made haste and ran and showed her husband and said unto him, Behold, the man hath appeared unto me that came unto me the other day. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said unto him, Art thou the man that spakest unto the woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, Now let thy words come to pass. How shall we order the child and how shall we do unto him? And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware. She may not eat of anything that cometh of the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. All that I commanded her, let her observe. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain thee until we have made ready a kid for thee. And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Though thou detain me, I will not eat of thy bread, and if thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. For Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, What is thy name? And when thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? So Manoah took a kid with a meat offering and offered it upon a rock unto the Lord. And the angel did wondrously. And Manoah and his wife looked on. For it came to pass when the flame went up toward heaven from off the altar, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. And Manoah and his wife looked on it and fell on their faces to the ground. But the angel of the Lord did no more appear to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord. And Manoah said unto his wife, We shall surely die because we have seen God. But his wife said unto him, If the Lord were pleased to kill us, he would have not received a burnt offering and a meat offering at our hands. Neither would he have showed us all these things, nor would as at this time have told us such things as these. May the Lord add the blessings to the reading of his word, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. I want to uh, do a little series here. It's uh, probably about four or five messages on 
the life of Samson, the life of Samson. But the, the thing that I think that's extremely important in understanding Samson is understanding where he came from, understanding his family. And so this morning, I want to preface this little series with Samson's parents. It never ceases to amaze me how that Israel could be so evil after God had shown and did so much for them. It just seems that over and over and over again, when God would do supernatural things for them, uh, from the moment of their conception as a nation, you know, coming out of Egypt land, going through the Red Sea and, and all the miracles in the wilderness, and yet they continuously uh, uh, murmured and complained, and at times they did gross evil in the sight of the Lord. Joshua, you know, which is the book uh, before uh, Judges, he records the inheritance of the Hebrews as a land that God gave them to possess. You remember Moses had, had, had died, and now the mantle was given over to Joshua, and he was going to take the, the Hebrew children or the nation of Israel into the promised land for their inheritance. Whereas Judges, the book of Judges, tells us of their inheritance despised and the constant failure of the people. There's nothing more disheartening when, when something is, is given to somebody and they don't cherish it. They don't uh, uh, hold it carefully, but they despise it. God basically introduced himself to mankind through the Hebrew people, Israel. But then when we consider those today whom God has done so much for, knowingly, they still distant themselves from their creator because of the evil passions that they still cling to in life. Samson's predecessor was Jephthah. And Jephthah delivered Israel from the Ammonites. And, and you can read all this at your own time in uh, Judges chapter 11. But his career as a judge was was decidedly mixed. He was known to hang out with company, uh, with a company of worthless fellows uh, in Judges 11.3. And the Bible does say very clearly here, let me just read it, that um, then Jephthah fled from his brethren and dwelt in the land of Tob, and there were gathered vain men to Jephthah, and he went out with them. You know, um, bad company corrupts good manners. And so we see this, this man going out and, and establishing himself with, with vain men, men that were not um, an asset to his life as a king and as a man of God. But his career, as it continued on, um, he, he did some strange things. If, if you recall, one of the, I think one of the most horrific stories, it, it ranks amongst many others, I guess, but, but this one really stands out to me, where they were at war with the, the Ammonites, and he said, Lord, if you'll, if you'll give the Ammonites into my hand, I'll give you I'll make a sacrifice, whatever comes through my house, whatever comes through my door, that will I offer. <laughs> well, sure enough, God turns the Ammonites over to him. There was a great, a great victory for them. And as he entered into his house, the first person to walk into his house was his only daughter. You know, so this rash vow that he made was, was incredible. I mean, it was, you know, and I don't, I, I can't speak for him. Why would a man make such a vow? And she, she said, Dad, let me, I'm giving you my paraphrase, but let me go and, 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 and run for, for two months, uh, uh, and bewailing my, my life and my virginity. And, and, and then she came back and he did what he was supposed to do. He offered her. You know, so, you know, Jephthah was just one of those people that, 
that as a judge, you know, and, and, and a lot of the judges, I think there were around 16 of them, you know, they, they didn't do very well uh, in their office. Matter of fact, uh, Jephthah went to war with the, uh, the tribe of Ephraim. And I, I want to say it was like he killed 45,000 of them, of his own people. And so, you know, this is, this is the condition of Israel. This is the, the, the setting for the life of, of, of Samson. In many ways, Jephthah is representative of the people of God during the era of the judges. Though the Lord frequently delivered the people and at times exercised faith, they really did, yet the people would constantly fall into great sin. The state of the people was reflected in the character. Now get this. <laughs> we can relate to this. The commitment and the life and character of the people was reflected through their leadership. I mean, we are really familiar with that today. When we look at the condition of America and other nations on the planet uh, when things are compromised and allowed to, to go on like never before in, 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 in the history of our nation, we see our nation plummeting into a, a condition that I really don't know that it, if it'll ever be recoverable. I, I just really don't see it. And I'm not trying to be a, a pessimist here but we might get a little reprieve, but I, I don't think we'll ever recover from the degradation that we've already experienced over these past few years. So the first thing, that, 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 that's the historical background here somewhat, but let's look at Samson's parents. Manoah and his wife seemingly were godly parents. Now, what fascinates me about this, this whole narrative here is Manoah's wife's name is never mentioned. She's She's always anonymous. And I just think that's, that's really interesting. And I, and I don't know why I, I got into rabbinic, uh, some rabbinic literature and, and there are names that are ascribed to her, but, but the Bible doesn't really give that. It, 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 if the Bible wanted us to know her name, they would have, they would have allowed it to, to, to be, but uh, it, it's not that way. But they were seemingly godly parents. And even though Israel was doing evil, there were still those who knew the fear of God. Always remember that. Whenever it seems like the majority of the people are, are doing things that are contrary to Scripture, contrary to the kingdom of God, always remember God's always going to have a people. They'll always be there. Amen. They may just be a few. It may just be a remnant but they'll always be there. One of my, one of my prayers, and, and I want to say I do this daily, but probably 99% of the time I, 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 I do this. But when I pray for Israel and when I pray for America, I'm always reminded of, of Elijah when he pronounced uh, uh, judgment on, on uh, Ahab and Jezebel, and, and then she wanted his hide on the wall, and so he ran, and, and he ran out into the wilderness, and and, uh, and said, Lord, there's nobody who wants to serve God but me. And, and the Lord spoke to him and said, there's still 7,000 that haven't bowed their knees to the way of Baal. I use that when I pray for our own country because I know that America is so big, amen, and there's so many beautiful people in this nation, amen, that it far surpasses 7,000 people, amen. There's a lot of good people that live in this country that know how to serve God and have a relationship with Him. I believe that judgment is one of the reasons why it's, it's held back is because God's people in this nation, amen. But we see that with, with uh, Manoah and his wife, the Bible says that she was barren. Uh, she couldn't, uh, she didn't have any children. And the angel of the Lord came and visited her and told her that she was barren no more. And so, the, you know, once again, what an interesting uh, visitation. But from his birth and long before his birth, the gifts of God were simply showered upon the life of Samson. 
One of the contemporary historians, Josephus, says this about Manoah. He was a person of such virtue that he had few men his equals. And without dispute, he was a man of principle in his country. It's also been said that Manoah's wife had such beauty that she far excelled her contemporaries. She is included among the 23 truly upright and righteous women who came forth out of the history of Israel. Not only was Samson separated unto God from his mother's womb, but in order to make his separation and dedication both sure and easy and natural to him, now listen to me, his mother had to be separated and dedicated to God first. Now, I know we had Mother's Day here a couple weeks ago, and we got Father's Day uh, in a couple weeks, but we're going to call this Parents' Day to this morning. Amen. There's so many times that when we as parents, we, we, we want our, kid to, our kids to love the Lord and with all their heart and, and, and soul and mind, but the parents don't want to pay the price for the example for their children to see. It's, I mean, it's quiet in here, but it's a fact. We want our kids to be what, something that we are not. But that wasn't the case with Manoah and his wife. They had to be dedicated to God first. Of all that was said to this woman, twice, there was a caution. The angel said, beware, beware. And if only mothers knew the depths of their influence with their children. If only mothers could get a hold of that. The influence that they have with their children. I've always taught and, and, and lived and, and preached that there is a relationship that my wife has with my children that I simply cannot have. And I've tried to have a good relationship with my kids and I, I feel I do, I really do. But my wife has a maternal bond with them that, that I can't have, amen. But it's challenged me as a father to, to step up to the plate and try to be as close to my kids as they were growing up as, as, I, as I possibly could, amen. Uh, Dr. DeWitt Talmadge, a clergyman, uh, a very, very good preacher, uh, said this, quote, 120 clergymen that were together began to share their conversion experiences and 100 out of 120 assigned their conversion to their mother, end of quote. That's, that's impressive, it really is. And so it, it's very important that you mothers in here understand the influence that, that you have with your children. I, I, I laugh sometimes, I, 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 I do. When, you know, we, we dads, and, and I can speak from the past, <laughs> but you know, when I disciplined my, my kids or something, it was my, my wife that they always ran to. Um, and you know, very seldom did they run to me, but sometimes they did. Because like I said, I really challenged this whole concept of the maternal uh, bond, you know, but I, I get a kick out of some of you. I, I get a kick out of uh, Chubby. I really do. You know, Chubby's what, 100 pounds? And uh, <laughs> he's a big boy. But uh, whenever he gets hurt or any of them get hurt, I mean, it's to mommy. It's to mommy. And I always, I always put it this way, you know, Peter was a mama's boy. <laughs> he sure was. But then so was I. I was a mama's boy. I I, I really love my my mom and my father. Matter of fact, I remember when Debbie and I, just in the first couple of weeks that we got married, my mom would call to see what we were eating for supper or something like that. How are you doing? And and uh, and my wife just, that, that was new to my wife. Amen. But, um, you know, you mothers in here have a tremendous influence on your children. 
that we dads do not have. But I like Manoah's approach. I like how he prayed. In verse 8 of chapter 13, Manoah said, after his wife comes and tells him what happened to her, then Manoah entreated the Lord. In other words, he prayed. And he said, O oh my Lord, let the man of God which thou did send come again unto us, not just to her, but unto us, and teach us, and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. God grant us this one request. Teach us, teach us how to raise that which you're about to give us and bless us. What a beautiful prayer. If the Lord tarries, wouldn't it be great to see these children here in this church be used of God to deliver others from evil? Because that was what Samson was born for, a deliverer of Israel. Why do we have so many children? People ask a, a couple times when, when our kids were really small. And it wasn't that I just wanted to keep having kids, but my personal mindset was I want my kids to have a positive impact on an evil world. That's why I wanted so many kids to have an influence on society. The whole purpose of, purpose of Samson's life was to help Israel. It's interesting, the Bible teaches us that God hears Manoah's request and then he reveals himself again in verse 9. And there's a couple of lessons to be learned here over his request. Teach us. The Bible says in Psalm 127.3, children are an heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. If we parents only understood what children are to God. Amen. These children are good. The ones that we have here this morning. They're good kids, each and every one of them. But you can only go so far as a parent in rearing them in the natural. What you need to do as a parent is to ask God, would you please teach us, teach us how to raise them spiritually because that's where the rubber meets the road. Amen. You don't want to raise them just because you love them and because it's the, the moral right thing to do. You want God to teach you to do it right. If you can have the desire to do that, seek God. I need wisdom. I mean, my, my kids can attest to this. When they were little, I'd set them on my lap and say, you've never been a kid before. I've never been the father of a kid before. So this was trial and error. When they got older, I'd set them on my lap. You know, you've never been a teenager before. I didn't set you on my lap as a teenager. But you've never been a teenager before. And I've never been the father of a teenager before. This is all trial and error. But what I meant by trial and error is seeking God, amen, as to how to raise each and every one of you. And then it came a time when my, and, and when, when my kids turned 18 years old, every one of them have been dedicated to the Lord as a, as a child. But when they turn 18 years old, my wife and I would take them out to dinner and we'd bring just that one child up here to the altar and rededicate them to the Lord as an adult. Because we want to know how to do it right. How to do it right. God hearkened to the voice of Manoah. Now here, here is something very, very rich for you husbands here. I think this is beautiful. This is one of those gold nuggets. God hearkened 
to the voice of Manoah, to the husband. But God shows himself to the woman, his wife. Did you get that when we read the narrative? Manoah asks and prays to God, but God seemingly circumnavigates Manoah and speaks to his wife. I think that's beautiful. The point is this. If we husbands, if we fathers can petition God on behalf of our children, God will reveal it through the wife because of her association with her kids. Oh yeah, it's real good. That's why it's so important that we fathers keep our wife before the Lord because God will give her what she needs to rear those kids because God also knows that she has a relationship with them that a dad simply doesn't have. In 1 Peter 1, 7, let, let, let me show you the profundity of, of this whole concept. In 1 Peter 1, 7, Peter says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that what? Your prayers be not hindered. So I've got to do the best that I can, amen, to, to, to dwell with my wife, even as it, <laughs> there were times I'd come home from work and she'd just be standing out there on the porch and she'd have that wooden spoon and she'd say, it's your turn. But I've got to understand this. I've got to be on the same page with her because if I'm not, that means my prayer life is going to be hindered. That's exactly what it says. It doesn't take a commentary to interpret that. Your prayer life will be hindered. Manoah prayed and God spoke to his wife and then Manoah offered the sacrifice. It's always the man of God that should take the initiative. Now, you men, listen to me. It's your house. You're the priest. Man up spiritually and take the leadership of your home. Do it. If you don't do it, this isn't going to work. It's the man, the man. Amen. It's, it, it's, it's God's order for leadership in the home. Manoah stepped up to the plate and said, well, we'll offer a kid. We'll offer a goat. What does sacrifice mean? Giving up something because of a sincere desire to draw closer to God. Hollowing a certain place for his service. Man, I hope you men in here have a, a special place where you meet with God. And when Manoah is done, I mean the angel in the flames of the sacrifice, ascends into heaven with, in the midst of the flames. And Manoah says, we're all going to die because we've seen God. We're going to die. But it's the, the wife. You have no idea how many times in the life of my wife and I in our marriage, in the ministry of 41 years, where my wife has been the stability in our relationship, in my relationship with God. She had the right thing to say at the right time.
And she says, no, we're not. Because God accepted the sacrifice. Duh. <laughs> Any of you dads in here ever feel like, duh, why did I see that? <laughs> Amen. Well, let me give you some, some thoughts here, some concluding thoughts here this morning. Samson's parents remained faithful to God in a time of utter social corruption and decay. They stayed faithful. Nowadays, the behavior of church people in general does not, is not noticeably different from society as a whole. You can't tell them apart. Christians who live faithful, pious, and humble lives shine as brightly as Manoah and his wife did. thought that was interesting. Ironically, the anonymous wife shines even more brightly than her named husband in this narrative. Manoah's wife came to him with a fantastic story. Now this is, this is good. Here's another nugget. She said, honey, man, did I have an experience. You know, there's other women in the Bible that had experiences. You know, Abraham's wife, Sarah, when she, you know, 99 years old or 100, and they said, you're going to have a baby, and, and she laughed. She said, you got to be kidding me. It ain't going to happen. And, uh, you know, so, you know, uh, Mary Magdalene, she had her own fantastic story. And, and, and what a difference it was. But here, here, here's, the, here's the thing that I enjoy about this. Manoah believed his wife immediately. He just did. Because he trusted her spirituality. Therefore, when he heard his wife's news, he immediately prayed for guidance. How many of us here today, pray only after we are headed out in our own direction and run into trouble. Not Manoah. He took it seriously. Oh God, teach us how to do it and to do it right. And if you'd come to the piano this morning, let me leave you with this thought-provoking question here this morning. As a parent, what kind of desires do you have for your children as they grow up? What are you pushing them towards? Fame and fortune? Or the kingdom of God? You know, as I was studying this and looking at it, I couldn't help but think of Ben and Naomi Baker and David and Alicia Lloyd raising their children in the ways of God only to see their lives conclude as martyrs, as martyrs. You see, it's in times like this. I'm sure they're hurting. There's no doubt about that. But we must believe in the providential care of God. God does things with us, our families, people that we're close to, a wife. He's so
sovereign. He's sovereign. And whatever he takes from us, regardless of the pain, regardless of the hurt, it's for our betterment. You have to believe that. You simply have to believe it. Believe it. Because he's God. And Jeremiah, I believe it, I didn't write this down, but Jeremiah 30 something, it says, you know, we think God is so bad sometimes because of these things happen, but God says, my thoughts towards you are good and they're peaceful because God has an expected end for you and me. He's a good God. A wonderful God. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Yeah, there's pain and there's sorrow. But I can conclude with the undisputed fact that God is sovereign. He's simply sovereign, and I love him for that. Because if I had it my way, things would be really different and probably be really bad. But he's sovereign. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. It's a good word.